What's up guys and welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here, then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, yeah. how you doing? And if you are into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you just watched the Liz Maguire movie at some point and you were like the Colosseum. Is that what it really looks like? What's up with all the history there? Well, then this is the place for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future because I explain all that kind of stuff for you in a really fun and sassy and lighthearted kind of way. So woohoo, thank goodness you found me. Anyways, as you can see from the title of today's video, I have a very, very special guest here to discuss her new book, A Spartan Sorrow, with me here on the channel. Her name is Hannah Lynn. And if that looks slightly familiar, that's because last week, was it last week or the week before? No, it was last week. <laughs> so last week I brought my friend Vruti onto the channel to discuss Hannah Lynn's first book, Athena's Child. Now today we will not be discussing Athena's Child with Hannah Lynn because I have already talked that to death with Vruti. So if you guys want to know what that book was about and all that kind of jazz, then you should definitely be hitting that white thing, whichever corner that pops up in, I never know. But <laughs> it's going to be popping up. You guys are going to check out that episode if you want to talk about that book specifically because today we will just be getting into this one. Now, what is this about? So, A Spartan Sorrow actually follows the story of Clytemnestra after husband Agamemnon kills her daughter. I'm not ruining them for you because this is a story that is told time and time and time again because it is tragic. It just is. Her daughter is killed by her husband as a sacrifice and it's really Clytemnestra's journey behind the scene that we never we never really get that in mythology. We never really know what's happening with Clytemnestra back in Mycenae as Agamemnon was fighting against the Trojans and arguing with Achilles and being a man-child, all of that kind of, you know, fun stuff that mythology gives us. We never really hear what happens to Clytemnestra at home during that 10 year period. So what Hanelin has done is that she's told the mythology, she's told the story of the 10 years, primarily from Clytemnestra being home at Mycenae, which was incredibly interesting. And she made these, I mean, you guys can see from all of my notes, she made these very interesting choices based off of the mythology that we already have and the plays that we have written about this story. And, and just her tale is just so compelling. I really, really enjoyed it. And that's why I asked her to come on this channel. And I do actually recommend this book for all of you guys, because I think it's a very interesting take on the mythology that is so famous. It's told in Aeschylus, it's told in Euripides, it's told in Homer. Like this story is one of the most popular stories that we have from the ancient world. And actually what I found that was the most compelling part of this story is that Hanelin doesn't make Aegisthus, who Clytemnestra ends up cheating on Agamemnon with Aegisthus, it's a, hot, it's a really long story. But I didn't think that Aegisthus was the bad guy, even though in every single mythology you end up hating Aegisthus and Clytemnestra. And in this one you kind of like both of them. It's just, it's a very interesting book. I think that everybody classes and non classes should read it. And so you know what, I'm just gonna ring Hannah Lynn right now so that we can get into the nitty gritty of this. You guys can read the full on review on my website, which is www.moaninc.co.uk, or we have a little snippet in the description below, which you guys are gonna wanna check out. And you can also buy the book in the description below. So definitely go check that out. And I'm just gonna ring Hannah Lynn and bring her on the channel. So welcome Hannah Lynn to Moan Inc. Thank you so much for taking time to sit down and chat with me as you're a very busy woman. So I really do appreciate you sitting down with me today. Thank you very much for the invite. It's very exciting to be here. I mean, I literally slid into your DMs and I was like, I don't know if she's even going to reply, but I love her book. Let's hope that she replies. So I was like, yes, a win. Brilliant. Very excited. Although I felt quite a lot of pressure because obviously you are so unbelievably glamorous and all your looks on YouTube. And I was like, oh, I've just spilled something down my top. I will change that. <laughs> but that's like, yeah, lockdown has not been good for me and kind of, you know, seeing people. So... Yeah, that was like, all right, I've got to, I've got to brush the hair <laughs> and, uh, and clean teeth and make sure that I look presentable. So this dull light, actually, it's all just rigged that way so that it looks really <laughs> dim so you can't see me. I mean, you know what? I only put on makeup for my YouTube videos. The other 90% of the time I'm sitting in like my sweats, I'm lying in bed and I'm like, no, don't even want to get my hair out of this bun or whatever it is. I'm like, no. Nope. But for a video, I'll be like, now it looks like I'm like this all the time when I'm just not. Yeah, it does. It does. It looks like you're, you're like that all the time. I'm like, I just can't do that. I, I, I that's beyond me. It's fine. You do the writing so that, that way I can sit down and read it all because I'm thoroughly enjoying your series thus far because I just did Athena's Child, did a review of that, which I loved. I thought that was so good. So hats off to you for that. And then I just finished, I do have my book here, my little Spartan, Spartan Sorrow, which I have a million notes for. Just, I know I sent you a photo, but like... That's amazing. I literally went through with a fine tooth comb and I was like, oh, I love this. And I had like my pencil with me. I love that because I am somebody who annotates books. 
And I know you get a lot of people like, you can't annotate books. Like, I love annotating books. I'm like, I love highlighting favorite passages and putting things in. And I know some people are like, oh, you can never write in a book. I'm like, yes. And I love the people writing my books. That's like, that's, that's the, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes to writing books and to loving them and to, yeah, as long as it's not like, oh, this bit was, ooh. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are a few of those, but um, no, I really, I just, but yeah, I like sort of looking at them just in that detail and then I can know I can come back to those parts. Well, that's exactly what I was doing then when I wanted to interview you. I had so many questions from all of these notes. And one of the main questions that I had throughout this whole thing was, what was the research process like for this book? Because it was so detailed. Like you went into such like amazing, like there were just so many parts that I circled being like, she must have had to either have gone to Greece to see this or to have Googled it extensively. So what, like, did you have a background in mythology or? No, so I'm a physics teacher um, and no no background in mythology, um, apart from I love it. Um, I have my first memory going on holiday with my family to Greece and my older brother telling me that the, the Minotaur was going to eat me. So that was really great um, when I was about four. That still stuck with me now 30 odd years later. So thanks for that. Um, and then we did, you know, family holidays to Greece and visited Ithaca and that kind of thing. But then I kind of lost, uh, lost touch with it. Like I'm a really eclectic reader. I, I read like I write, which is that story. That's, you know, I go for stories, which doesn't help me as an author because I genre hop because I'm like, I want to tell this story. I want to tell that story. But I read like that as well. Um, and actually it was interesting because you posted in your um, review of Athena's Child, the sculpture of Athena holding Perseus's head. And that's what got me back sort of head first into it. When I saw that um, about three and a half years ago now, three years ago, I just saw that I was like, whoa, I didn't know that version. Why do I not know that? Like I, I knew I wasn't a classicist, but I felt like I had a good grounding and I was like, but I didn't know this. And I feel like everyone should know this because it's wrong and what you talked about in the review i know we're talking about spartans but on athena when you were talking about the, the blame culture that was really what sort of i latched onto was just like hold on but nothing's changed like we've traveled this far nothing's changed and i was like right i need i need to write this story and i i need to write it now so then obviously once i got back into the myths and then it's like oh wow yes i am i love them and so in terms of research, yes, Googling, <laughs> Googling a lot. And it's so tricky because of course you've got so many conflicting stories and so many conflicting versions and trying to decide on a, um, a route to take was, was really, it's, it's tricky. Um, my husband is my hugest critic, but he also first reads everything and finds all my um, plot holes or tries to. I sometimes put a few too many in there for him to find me who finds all my plot holes. And he'd be like, going, but I read this version. And I'd be like, yes, but look, there's this one and this one and there's this one and this one. So yeah, we just spent a long time, months just going, okay, this is this is where we're going from. In terms of, yeah, Mycenae and just, and, and the Delphi and going through all the images and all the Google Earths and just like, okay, this is this is where I, I am. I need to be here. What's funny that you say about like your husband picking, you know, the different myths that he had heard and all that kind of stuff. Cause I find that people do that with my YouTube videos as well. I'll be telling one mythology or I'll say, this is the one that we have from Hesiod or something or whoever it happens to be. And people will be like, that's not the one I heard. And I'm like, that is the one in this version though. We're not talking about your version, hold on. <laughs> so I do identify with that a lot that when you want to tell one version of the story, you're like, let's just focus on that, please. Yeah, it's it was it was really tricky. And like you said, and the thing is with the internet and with posts out there, like so many things just get changed in so many ways. It's like, right, no, I need to go back to the original. What is the, What are these ones telling me? And then I'll adapt from there. Um, yes, it's, I really enjoy it though. I really, and like looking at the, the next one as well, um, I really do enjoy sort of building those worlds, putting all the worlds that are already there together and just growing it. Yeah, I think my, my research on this is just, I love it. Well, one thing that you just said, which I think is, is very obvious, is how you said like Google mapping everything and Google earthing all the sites, because as someone who's been to my senior, I think it's like my favorite site in the entire world. 
Like I could tell that you had once again either been there or you knew it so well because you spoke about like the lion's gate and then where the throne room was and the grave circles. And I was like, this, this is exactly where everything is. Like I'm walking through the site as she's telling the story, which was so, it was so fun for a classicist to read in that way. Even though, you know, like there were different storylines and all that kind of stuff, the actual sites were right which I really liked. Okay, I'm very glad because that's always <laughs> like, you know, like I'm, I'm sure this is how it is. This is like, I'm going for it. I'm, but there's always the, uh, the, the flicker of doubt that you, you do the best you can. Um, and I know that sometimes the best will not be good enough, but you just have to keep trying. So I'm glad that it, it sort of immersed you in it the way I hoped it would. Absolutely. There was also one thing that you, you missed, but I felt like you missed it purposefully because you didn't include the treasury, the tomb of Atreus, which I also DM'd you about, which I knew was a conscious decision because Mycenae was so right that I was like, she obviously knows these things exist, but she chose not to. And I'm wondering why it wasn't in there, why that was a decision that you chose to chop it out. So it was, it was actually chopped out at a later, so it was in there. Um, in terms of the Aegisius and the Clytemnestra, um, development of their relationships and their meetings um that took a that took a big cut in like the final couple of drafts so that um going down I had a lot more in there with their development of the relationship but I also felt it slowed the pace of the books down so I decided that a lot of that needed to go so I, I wanted to kind of condense things a lot and making that a meeting point for them uh, just acted as a way that I could sort of bring forward his personality quicker and why he was there quicker. And it, it sort of sped that up, if that makes sense a bit. So it's kind of, I'm losing that, but it's for the sake of the pace in this story, I think it needs to go there instead. So that was why that one was there. Well, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Like I said, it, it did seem like a very conscious decision. Like it wasn't like, like there are times when you read stories where you're like, this person just doesn't know that exists. And that's why they didn't mention it. Where because everything else was so bang on, I was like, no, no, she knows this thing exists and she's choosing to ignore it. And I didn't know why. I came up with a bunch of different theories, which I spoke about with a bunch of the other little classes on uh, Instagram, where I was like, do we think that she did it because it was too archaeological? Do we think she did it because it was too complicated to include like a chamber tomb and a Tholos tomb and a all of that kind of stuff and it no and it was it was like there there are things it's just like i just need the pacing sometimes often when i go writing i'm like i want to put this bit in and i want to go down this road and i'm gonna write about this and i get sort of very self-indulgent and then my husband as i said it's like just no it's just like <laughs> that's for you that doesn't need to be in there so that was kind of one of those those parts there. That's completely fair. I mean, but also, and I said this to you as well in a DM, just so that everybody knows, like I literally DM'd Hannah so much before this. I was like, I love this book. We have to chat about it. But one of them was that I ended up being Team Aegisthus, which I told you, which was really weird because I have never had that reaction. Like I read every single one and I'm like, he's trash, he can go away. But this version made me really like him and really feel for him. And I'm curious as to why you took that route with Clytemnestra, that she ends up actually having a, a really loving relationship with him. And it's just the whole sort of facade that is like misinterpreted by everybody else. I think he'd gone through a lot of rubbish, right? He's gone through some awful things. And I, I don't know, I just feel like there had to be, there had to be a kindredness there like with what he'd experienced and what she experienced, like how could there not be this kind of mutual understanding within that? Like I just, it just didn't, it didn't sit well with me for the Clytemnestra I wanted either. Like the Clytemnestra I wanted wasn't that she's just vengeful, that's it. Like that wasn't what I was trying to get across, you know, it needed to be a, a fully rounded person. And in answer to your other questions, like most of them are like mother. It's like, it just needed to be that. And our, if knowing Aegisthus' story, she couldn't have responded like that. Like, I just don't feel that that 
that didn't sit right. So there were a few things. And in answer to, to your questions later on, it will, it will be like, it just didn't sit right with the Clytemnestra I, I felt was there with this sort of level of compassion. Like she has to have such an extreme level of compassion because, you know, she, she didn't murder Agamemnon for no reason. You know, that was because of what he'd done. And that, I don't believe that people would just swap, you know, oh, I'm just hugely compassionate and loving that. No, now it's gone. So it was, it was her, it was about her development that it needed to be that kind of relationship. I mean, I agree with you on Kleishmanesha not being just vengeful for the sake of being vengeful. And I've said before on my channel that I was like, there was a 10 year period where Agamemnon could have said sorry via some kind of way. And he chose not to, which I always read. And I'm just like, could he not have sent a messenger with like a flower? Like, I don't know, anything. In 10 years, you're telling me he couldn't do that? Of course she was mad. Like, of course she had 10 years to sit on this awful traumatic thing that happened to her. And in saying that, was that like that whole sort of Iphigenia story, was that the thing that really drew you to her character? Or was there another element of her story? It was that, but it was also the Orestes' part as well. Just the following it through, um, just the, the combination of them. But yes, I have a little girl and I was just like, yeah, if any, that, I, that, that, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> like, you would go, you would go crazy. So that was, that was the big, yeah, the big draw there was just the sort of protective mother aspect of it. And that's part that I really liked in your books. I think it's one that the mythology doesn't pick up on that much. They don't give her that sort of storyline. They always are like, oh, well, she just got mad when Agamemnon came home. And one thing I think was really interesting about your uh, characterization with all of these different mythologies was that you still gave Agamemnon the influence of Artemis when it comes to killing Iphigenia, and you still gave Orestes the, the influence of Apollo when he has to kill Clytemnestra, because they are really difficult storylines. And I say this all the time, that mythology is a tough, it's a tough subject. It deals with tough topics, but you didn't give Clytemnestra the, the influence of the curse of the house of Atreus. And you let her have a really human story in amongst this supernatural world. And I'm wondering why you did, I think it was actually really well, because I think it, it allowed the reader to really reason with this character much more than having just a curse placed on her. I think it comes though from looking at the character, from looking at her. And I suspect if I'd looked more at Agamemnon, like you, I could change the perspective so it still came from that way, if that makes sense. Like I was so focused on her, on her feelings, on her actions, on her responses that I just, yeah, it, it, I don't know. Sounds wrong to say it just didn't feel like the, the most important part of her actions. I felt like she, she was so in control of them. Like, you know, she talked to, to Odysseus about the curse on the family and, and she, she does believe that, but also believes that she's in charge of her, herself. She believes she's in charge of her, her own fate. Um, I discussed this with question with my my husband, and he was just like, "Well, I just felt like that. The men always, the men all come out better with these things with the gods than the women do." He's like, "I just felt like, you know, he felt like it was one of these like, no, it's give them their own pathway." And yeah, I love the fact that you gave her her own storyline. Like, I actually really liked that part of it. And even with her backstory, like you gave her like an, another family, and then you have her have a. a tertiary family at that point with just this so she has all these different tries and is that also tying into her then wanting to have her own storyline is wanting it's her wanting to control her narrative i think is the thing is like okay so tantalus maybe we're not the case of that curse maybe we are going to have love and a happy family in this and it's like okay that didn't work out agamemnon it's not really working out but i have got my children so maybe this is how that's going to work out hold on no it's still not working out but i've still got a jesus in my life maybe maybe this is how it's going to work out it's like they're still not going to work out sorry um <laughs> yeah i just feel like it was it was the constant of her trying to sort of trying to overcome it and to feel in control of things. But we've spoken a lot about Clytemnestra and I really wanna focus on Orestes because I loved that you really dealt with Orestes like emotional character. Like his, 
his characterization in your book is so like delicate. Like I just wanted to hop onto the page and like hug him. I was like, this this guy isn't capable of doing anything he's about to do. Like he's not. Yeah. <laughs> he's not okay with this. But I feel like as an author, I'm not an author, so I could be totally wrong. I feel like as an author, you chose the hardest option for telling his story because you gave him two dual storylines in the second half of the book. You gave him his romantic relationship and also uh, the whole, he has to murder his mother thing, which neither of those are easy to write, I can't imagine. And you wrote both of them and made them work together the entire time, which I was like, how is this not so overwhelming for her to do? So how did you, like, like why did you think that he needed both of those storylines together? Well, he's got to have he's got to have the murder in the mother. That's that's going nowhere. <laughs> like, I couldn't change that one. I think people would be mad at me for that. And um, I felt like Pilates was the other side to Electra. And had he just been influenced by Electra the whole time, and he was still quite young, I think it would have been easier for him to have just gone with her, gone with. Okay, that's. Yeah, that this is what the gods have said. Fine, I'll go and do it. Um, but in having Pilates there, it it made him retain more of himself. He could retain himself, and he could question it. And it he had somebody in his corner. You know, it's somebody that that saw him for who he was. Because I don't. That's one of Electra's things. I don't think she really saw people for anything other than you know. Well, this is your role. This is what you have to do. And so that was very hard for, for the Arrestes I wrote. So whereas Pilates is like, no, this, it's you as you. That's that's what I like about you. And um, yeah, so their relationship just, yeah, just went, went straight through it. And I like those two. <laughs> I like those two together. Well, with Electra, I loved your Electra because I am a big fan of Electra. I know lots of people don't like her, but I think she's such a strong, she's so headstrong in mythology. She's so like, just, brutal she's absolutely ruthless in mythology and she's just such a strong woman that i love that she's been written into mythology like she's one of my favorites and you kept her so close to the mythology which is why i loved her so much because you didn't like make her emotional or anything like that like you just gave her nope this is how she is this is who she's going to be in my storytelling as well and i'm wondering why you decided that she couldn't change that you were like she's the one that i have to show her through and through that's just what she was it, it wasn't a deli it wasn't a deliberate not changing um she was exactly what the story needed at uh, sorry i did mention <laughs> that we have a cat problem in this house didn't i i like the humor i could bring with with electra um and with the rest days together and yeah i felt like that that was there everything i needed was her with her was there was no need for a softer side. That isn't who she was, you know? She's the one that got as much of the Spartan as there was to offer. Like just, yeah, the, the sort of harshest side of Clytemnestra as well. So you could see hopefully sort of both sides of Clytemnestra and her children, but Electra got the, uh, got the harsh side. So she was, she was fun, um, but I didn't like her. <laughs> like <laughs> I wrote her, I was like, just have some compassion, like, come on. Now, uh, so your first book was Athena's Child as I reviewed on the channel, which as I keep saying, I loved because, and I'm just gonna throw this in there again, because I'm a big fan of Perseus. So you gave him his little two cents of like, it wasn't all Perseus' fault either. He was just equally as much of a pawn as Medusa was, which I was like, thank God someone did it because everyone just hates on Perseus. And now you've done Clytemnestra, Who's next? Like, are you going to do like a, because I know it's a trilogy from looking online. So who's the next one that you're dealt so with? So I, I'm shifting a little bit across. So I do have another more modern um, Greek one appearing. Um, but before that, I'm going to Hippolyta and Penthesilea, I can never pronounce. I'm so excited. I'm just like doing the Amazons on my channel. So I'm so excited about this. Yeah, these are ones, as you've seen, like I, I just do the stories I want to do, which is why half my stories are comic. <laughs> I've got some urban fantasy dystopian in there. Um, and then just these. Um, and that's the story that it's just like, yes, this one can't wait any longer. So that's what's being worked on now. Um, and like I said, I, I love 
the research stage and I'm at the research stage at the minute and it's just like, oh, I just, so much. But of course, you know, like any of these researchers, it's like, ah, so he's going to turn up then, but he hasn't actually been there. Oh, you go. I've got my mapping stage with my various, got to decide on a, on what route to take, but that will be the next one. And I'm really, really excited about that. Oh my God, I can't wait. But I mean, literally, I didn't even know that you had written this one. And I was just like, oh, I really like to see this child. Let's see if she wrote anything else. And then this was like the first one that popped up. I was like, oh, hello, mine now. <laughs> just basket bought. I'm so glad. <laughs> I love, I really, really enjoy, well, I really enjoy writing. That's why I'm writing. Um, but I, I love getting immersed in these stories and getting immersed in these times. And yeah, I think I take on completely different personas during where I'm, where I'm writing them, you know? It's like when I'm in a Clytemnestra mood, it's like, don't, don't. don't <laughs> but this this next one again is, is really good fun. And it's, I like writing relationships, you know, whatever, whatever, Whatever genre I'm in, that's always the main theme that's running through them is how the relationships develop and how a person's developing. And I, I really like showing that transformation. And obviously in this story, there's so much chance for that because I've got both the sisters and how they, they transform. So really, really looking forward to that one. So thank you very much, Hannah, for doing this interview with me again, because I did bombard your DMs and tag you in like every single photo on Instagram. Cause I was like, I'm going to make sure that she loves me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> I like made sure way ahead of time, but thank you still for taking time out of once again, being an author, being a mother, being abroad, you're not in the UK chatting to me. So thank you so much for coordinating. Um, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. I, I am greatly appreciative of that said before. So thank you for all your support with the book and for taking time out to talk to me as well and deal with cats interrupting the interview. <laughs> I'm sure even our viewers enjoyed the cats if I left it in. If not, then you'll just have to trust me. It was very adorable. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. You're going to want to hit that subscribe button and that bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future once again. And I uh, will see you next time with more interviews here on Monique. So we'll see you then. <laughs>